What's going on, LHS? We're here with a very special guest today, the legendary Daryl McDaniels of the pioneering hip-hop group Run DMC. He was visiting Linden today to talk to our elementary school students about his new children's book, Daryl's Dream. It was nice enough to stop by our studio to talk with us. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So tell us about your book. Well, actually doing a children's book wasn't in the plan. Um, I speak at a lot of schools. If I'm not touring or if I'm not at a Comic Con, because um, before I put this children's book out five years ago, I put out a comic. I started a comic book company. So if I'm not at a Comic Con, if I'm not doing a concert somewhere, I speak at schools. Well, so what made you want to write the book? I didn't want to write the book. The <laughs> teachers and the educators made me write it. I spoke at a bunch of schools in Brooklyn, New York, and about the third time, the teacher was like, you can't leave here until you promise to write a, write a book. And I was like, no, nah, I don't write a book because um, I don't like to commercialize anything that I do because I feel it's a responsibility because for me to be blessed with hip hop and rock and roll and to do all the things that I do, it's my responsibility to go back and you know communicate and have dialogue with the younger generation. But they was like, yo, if you write a book, you can reach so many kids every day, all day, without having to be there all the time. I was like, I never thought about it like that. So it's kind of, the book kind of does the same thing I've always done with my music. Good to see you, Jenny. <laughs> Thanks. Do you have any message for kids who have been bullied or are going through bullying now? Yeah, the, the first thing to understand is when you're getting bullied or teased or picked on, you don't have the problem. What people need to understand, the bully or the person doing the teasing has a problem. You know what I'm saying? And it's a problem that could be solved, but because the he or she is not being in, put in a position where they could talk about the emotions that they're going through or whatever it is that they're going through, they feel that they got to lash out at others. You know, when, um, when I was coming up in Queens in the late 60s and early 70s, and even in the 80s before I made my songs and, you know, made my records, bullying was a problem that exists in every generation. So I like to tell people get bullied and teased on, you don't have the problem. The bully has the problem. And then secondly, you have to be able to speak up. You know what I'm saying? You have to be able to go tell somebody about the situation that's going on. And that's not snitching. You know, you, 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 you say to yourself, okay, if I go tell somebody I'm being bullied, or even if you see somebody getting bullied and picked on, it's not that you're snitching. I always tell young people, you're getting the bully help. You know what I'm saying? Because you, you're perfect the way you are. The bully is just attacking you because there's something he or she doesn't like about him, him, him or herself. So in Daryl's dream, mm -hmm. did you have to go through bullying in the book? Yes. It's, yeah. it's me in the third grade, and when I was in school, um, I still wear glasses, but I wore glasses, so my whole life was, hey, four eyes, hey, binoculars, hey, telescope, you know, blind is a bad. Kids used to take my glasses and hide them from me. So now I'm in class, I can't see nothing. But that didn't stop me from learning. But it was just those everyday things where I got teased, bullied, and picked on because I wore glasses. And I was a geeky, nerdy kid, and all I did was read comic books. So I was the nerdy, geeky, weirdo kid who, read who wore glasses that read comic books. But the fact that I was always reading made me a straight-A student. So, you know, it was the, hey, Brainiac, hey, Mr. Smarty Pants. So I went through it all. But the good thing that happened was when hip hop came over the bridge from the Bronx and the Queens, because it started in the Bronx, and when it came in the Queens, hip hop gave me a voice. So now it was like, okay, Daryl can talk about being Daryl without being ashamed, and I don't have to follow anybody, and I don't have to fit in with anybody. So most of my rhymes that I was writing was about me wearing glasses. You know, DMC, D's for doing it all of the time, M's for the rhymes, that are all mine, C's for cool, cool as can be. And my partner Run would ask me, why you wear those glasses? I would be like, so I can see, you know what I'm saying? And then that was so powerful, like embracing what everybody was teasing me about. I embraced it and it was so powerful that people that don't even need glasses want to wear glasses now. If you, if you ask anybody 
Why is glasses popular in hip hop? It's because of DMC, the guy with the glasses. <laughs> And back there, they can see you with the glasses. Yeah, yeah, they were ultra Goliaths. <laughs> ultra Goliaths? Yeah, a lot of people thought they were gazelles, but they were ultra Goliaths. Because I like the big, thick frames, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's one of those things where when you look at hip hop, everything always started small and then grew. Like it started with a tape recorder, then it was the boombox. It started with sunglasses, then it became the thick, you know, the ultra Goliaths and the gazelles. It started with a gold chain and then had the big dookie rope chains. The girls used to wear regular earrings and then it was the truck big earrings. So hip hop has a tendency for making everything bigger than it actually is. Well, I know you said you love to read, but is this mm -hmm. like the first book you actually written or have you written other ones? Oh, no, this is, um, prior to this book, I wrote two more adult themed books. Um, the first book I put out was uh, called uh, the King of Rock, Respect, Responsibility, and My Life for Run DMC. It was just basically talking about all the stuff that um, I went through. Um, you know, how Run DMC got together, who was our inspirations, all the um, early inspirations of the early years of hip hop. The second book was a book that I put out about four years or five years ago. It was called 10 Ways Not to Commit Suicide because when I was 35 years old, I'm 57 years old now, when I was 35 years old, um, I got really, really depressed. Um, I started drinking, so I was an alcoholic, suicidal, metaphysical, spiritual wreck. Even I was DMC who wanted to kill itself and was crazy about that. While that was going on, when I was 35 years old, I found out that I was adopted. And everybody in the neighborhood knew, all my cousins knew, all the teachers knew, the male, and it was one of those things, it's a secret, don't let Daryl know he's adopted. So that was a big shock for me. And then after that, and then and there, uh, Jam Master Jay got shot and killed. So all of this happened one after the other. And the reason why I did the book is, it wasn't until I went to seek help for what I was going through, like I went to therapy. And I found out that therapy is the most gangster thing anybody, man, woman, boy or girl, adult or child could do for themselves because it helps you deal with the feelings that you have. It's okay to have those feelings. It's cool to be sad, it's cool to be scared, it's cool to be afraid, it's cool to be vulnerable, it's cool to be weak, it's cool to be depressed, but you need to understand your strength is not being afraid to seek help. Let me say that again. You need to understand your strength is not being afraid to seek help. So it was when I went to therapy, and you just go to therapy and just talk about how you're feeling. And that is the thing that allowed me to um, stop drinking. I've been sober for 15 years now, and um, I'm back on the right path now. I can focus on being creative, because when I went to therapy, my therapist told me everything that I was doing musically was kind of like a therapy for me without me knowing it. And then when I stopped doing those things, I thought I needed, it's what I talked about to the kids today earlier over at school four, um, I started looking for things outside of me that I thought would help give me strength. And then I realized that Jim Beam, Johnny Walker, and Jack Daniels didn't have my best interests at hand. So when I did that book, I, th I, I saw how it was helping people. Because it was people that was like, yo, okay, if DMC is, is, is man enough to go get help, maybe it's cool for me to get help. And a lot of the things that I was going through as adults was a lot of things that started when I was in school as a little kid. Because, you know, when you're in high school and when you're in middle school and when you're in elementary school, you know, if you hear that kid that says, I hate school. The kid don't hate school. He or she is, there's a person, place, a thing at school causing those anxious feelings, those afraid feelings and stuff like that. So it's full circle for me. Telling stories with a book or telling stories with, a mu with music or telling stories. My next thing I want to do is start doing films. I want to get like you guys and be producers and journalists and storytellers. So with that being said, are we to expect any new books from you? Yes, that's a great question. This is my first book. Um, I did it with a partnership uh, with Nickelodeon. You know, incredible Nickelodeon. That's impressive, yeah. With TV shows and cartoons and animated features. Um, the book is um, um, published through Random House. But Daryl's Dream is the first book in a series of books. It's probably going to be maybe 
20 to 30 more books of Daryl's Dream, and then we're going to do a, we're going to do a, a series of chapter books for like when Daryl when you know when Daryl gets in fifth, sixth, seventh grade, the adventures even get more complex. We're going to make it uh, more interesting so that the kids could grow with it. And we're also in talks of doing an animated series on Nickelodeon. That's cool. So yeah, this is just the beginning of, of, of some more great stuff to come. Well, how did you get like invited to Linden? How did you get here? Well, like I said, I always visit school and the superintendent, Mrs. Hazelton, um, I spoke at her um, schools in um, Long Island, in New Long Island out in New York. And when she came out here, she wanted to continue of us working together to collectively inspire, motivate, while we educate the children to empower them so they can see the abilities and capabilities that exist inside of them regardless of their situation. So I've been speaking, um, um, the superintendent, Mrs. Hazelton, she told me we've been working together for like 14 years. It's crazy. So like I said, I spoke at a lot of schools and she remembered um, the, the impact that we had out in Queens, New York. I mean, out in Long Island. So I said, sure, I'll come to Jersey and speak. And I live in Jersey now, too. So it made sense for me to come and meet the people out there. So earlier, as uh, I said before, you spoke at school for, so mm -hmm. tell me about the events uh, today. How do you think about it? It was amazing. It was simply amazing. Um, you know, usually I show up at the school, I speak and, and do that. When I got to school four, they had this whole presentation for me. All the teachers got up and danced <laughs> to, to my music. So that was amazing. Um, it was beautiful to see the reception and the attentiveness of all of those third graders. Like it was real third graders. And like I said, when I go into the school, I think what's really cool is, especially for the young kids, because they might not know who I am. They might have heard it's tricky on TikTok. So they know this is. DMC from Run DMC, he's the TikTok song guy, man. But their mothers and fathers, and I've been around so long, their grandmothers and grandfathers know who I am. They know Run DMC and everything that we did and stuff like that. But I think what's cool for the kids, when I go and speak even to the young kids, I don't go in there and go, hi kids, I'm the first, I don't speak to them like kids, I speak to them like people. So right then and there, they're gonna pay attention and see what I got to say. And um, they were very receptive, even to the point my favorite part of you know speaking to, to, to kids, especially those young ones, is um, the question and answer period. Because then you know I speak to them like people, and then they, they'll respond like people. You know what I'm saying? Because they're little people now, but they're going to be the big people that they are as little people when they grow up. So I kind of noticed that. I've been in this, you know, I've been making music for 38 years now in the hip hop business. So. It's good that I can communicate with the younger generation, but school four, I, I told um, Miss Hazelton that school four hands down had the best presentation of school so far. <laughs> really? Yeah. And in Pride. Yeah. When um, at school four, I seen a lot of the teachers had the Adidas Superstars that you mm -hmm. made iconic. With like, I want to know how you feel about the new Yeezys, Adidas line with Kanye. Uh -huh. How you feel about the Yeezys? I love them. Yeah. No curls, no braids, PZ heads still get paid. I am the reason why Yeezys can get made. Let's not forget that. <laughs> no, it's all about generationally empowering the next generation. Like when we, now having sneaker deals was unheard of unless she was an athlete. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't happening. So in 1986, we was, you know, we robbed about everything. So we were just sitting around one day and said, yo, let's do a song about our sneakers that we love. So we came up to, with the idea for My Adidas. So we put the record My Adidas out. While that was happening, Adidas was busy being Adidas. So that every month, every week, they would have meetings to see how their sneakers were selling. So for some reason, they're looking at the superstar, Shelto, and they don't know why it's selling, like they couldn't even keep it on the board. It's like the sales was crazy. And rumor has it, it was a young guy, a young intern working at Adidas. Um, their, their North American base is in, in California, in L.A. So they're doing their big meeting. And rumor has it, it was a young intern comes into the meeting. And they're like, why is the sneaker selling like this? What's going on? We're not doing no ads to it. We're not doing no advertising, no promotion and marketing. 
And the young dude was like, dude, y'all don't know? There's a rap group named DOC. They made a record about your sneakers. And they was like, okay, first of all, what in the world is rap? What in the world is hip hop? And what in the world is a run DMC? So Adidas is funny. Um, we was touring. Um, we was touring the country at that time. So we had a show at Madison Square Garden. So Adidas was like, "Yo, call up um, Rush Productions." And Def Jam didn't even exist yet. Call up Rush Productions. Call up. No, Def Jam did start because LL was on Def Jam. But it was like um, Rush. Russell Simmons had Def Jam just starting, but then uh, he still had Russell. Um, Russell Rush Management Company. So Adidas was like, yo, call up and ask for some tickets to the show. So Adidas called up, yo, we want some tickets to the show. Oh yeah, cool. So we gave him some tickets. The day of the show, it's a sold out Madison Square Garden. So we doing our set, we like seven records deep in. So we stop and Run goes to me, yo D, take it off. And I take off my sneaker, right? And he runs like, hold it up. And I hold up my sneaker on the stage of Madison Square Garden, the whole Madison Square Garden all had new Adidas and they held it up. So imagine if you're working at a company, you're like, yo, this is crazy. So they ran back to LA. Yo, it's true. There's a guy, there's a group called Run DMC. There's this thing called hip hop, this and that boom makes. So we was the first non-athletic entity to receive a major sports endorsement from a, a, a you know, a sports apparel company. And that was like the whole start of the whole sneaker culture thing right there. So. To see Kanye taking it to that next level is amazing. You know what I'm saying? So now that we did it, Kanye's here. It's no telling what your generation can do now. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, you know, Yeezy is doing it as a partnership with Adidas, but even you hear Kanye talk, his dream is for us to have our own sneakers. So look, Run DMC got us the deals. Kanye got the deals. So now it's up to the next generation to start self where we own the company, where we don't have to go outside. You know, we create it, we own it, and we control it. That's the next thing to do. But I'm I'm proud to be alive to see all this going on too. So it makes me feel like a little kid. <laughs> well, you mentioned that you're from Queens. What was life growing up in your neighborhood? Yeah, growing up in Queens, it, it's funny. Um, when people talk about Queens, if, if you go back and do your history of the 60s and 70s, Queens wasn't mentioned. It was always Brooklyn. You know, when you think about New York, it was always do a die bed style. Or it was the Bronx, you know, because it was hard. And then you had, um, you know, you had Manhattan, you know, uh, money making Manhattan. So Queens is, a, is like a suburb. It wasn't as harsh as Harlem and the big city and the Bronx. So if you're growing up on Queens, it's like a, um, a nice neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? We had, like, like out here, I guess, but, you know, we, we had lawns and backyards and stuff like that. We had projects, but we didn't have the big tenement building projects, like, that is known for that. So where I lived down in Hollis, it was, like, from 193rd Street to 205th Street. And if you listen to the Adidas records, we talk about being up on 205th Street. So 205th Street was, like, the place to go. That's where all the drama and all of that's where, you know, that's where it went down on 25th Street. But otherwise, it was a lot of, um, we had like block associates and stuff. We had, um, the, what else did we have? We had the UBA. There was things for kids to do. But we also had gangs. We also had death. We also had fighting. also had drugs and all of that. So the reason why Run DMC's music was so universal that we're products of both of those things. But I think the thing that was unique about Hollis was if you had the potential to be successful, the gangsters and the gangbangers wouldn't say, yo, you gotta join us. Like if you was doing, yo, you run entrapment, yo, you can't be up here. Mm. Or you did, even if something like, yo, you got piano lessons, yo, you can't be up here. Cause we saw that, yo, you don't have to be here. You know what I'm saying? So I think that was the difference that, you know, Run DMC, we was hard, but we wasn't like violent. Yeah. But we were pro like, we looked like the places that we came, but we was able to present both sides. So um, growing up in Hollis, it was a place where knowledge and strength was um, duly respected. Like if you was a school kid, 
all right, cool, you're going to go to school. If you was an athlete, you know, we, you wouldn't be prevented from getting out of here if you had that opportunity. So, but it, it wasn't, you know, you know, I can't say that because everybody said, yo, Hollis was crazy. We was a little town that was just as powerful as the Bronx, Manhattan, and everybody else. But we also had a vision to where we don't have to live a negative lifestyle if we don't have to. So I think like music was your vision. How did you know you wanted to get involved into music? I didn't want to be in music at first. When hip hop came to me, now let me go back. Run and his brother Russell, everything that hip hop is doing right now, Run saw that in his living room. What I mean by that, before the first rap record, Rappers Delight, Russell, Run's brother, was a manager of rappers and he was a party promoter, meaning this, before all of this video and radio stuff, you, y'all two would play in the park for free every summer. And you'll get like a thousand people, every time y'all set up in a park, a thousand people will show up. So Russell was running the promoter, was like, whoa, every time he plays, a thousand people show up. So Russell was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go rent the PAL Night Center every Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. I'm gonna come to y'all and say, yo, I want y'all to play indoors. I'm gonna give y'all a hundred dollars every night. And y'all like, what? I'm gonna get play, paid to do what I do for free. So when hip hop moved indoors, Russell was one of the people at the door making the people pay for what they could see free to do that. So Run saw the business of hip hop happening in his living room with all the early hip hoppers on Grandmaster Flash, a Soul Sonic Force, Houdini, Jimmy Spicer, DJ Hollywood, Curtis Blow. If you do your history, all the hip hop that existed before Rappers Delight. So when Rappers Delight came out, now hip hop is on records. So now everybody DJing and rapping and them seeing, they want to make records now. So Russell was managing a pioneer, pioneering rapper named Curtis Blow, who put out this song called The Breaks. And Curtis Blow, here's a bit of trivia for you. Curtis Blow actually had the first Christmas rap. The song was actually called Christmas Rapping. So Curtis Blow had the first Christmas song. So Curtis Blow was huge back then. Run, he's 12 years old. He's seeing all of this going on. He's continually asking his brother Russell, yo, Russell, let me make a record. But Russell's like, yo, you're a kid. You're too young. You know what I'm saying? You ain't even out of high school yet. I'm not letting you make a record. Yo, Russell, I'm nice, man. I got skills. So one of the things that Joe had, he had ambition. Yo, I'm nice. Russell was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. So Run was persistent. Yo, Russell, let me make a record. Let me make a record. I got skills. I got rhymes. I know what I can talk about. So Russell was like, here's the deal. Show me a diploma. Show me a high school diploma, and I'll let you go in the studio and make a record. So Run was like, okay. It's a bet. I remember that. So f after four years of high school, Run was like, so Russell's like, shucks. So, you know, you got to let him make a record. Yeah. So during that time, Run was always Run. He was always known. I was just writing rhymes just to write them. And then one day in ninth grade, Run was like, yo, D, you wrote these rhymes? And I was like, yeah, it's just a hobby. And then ninth grade was like, yo, whenever I make my record, I'm putting you in my group. So ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Me and Run went to totally different high schools. So Run's getting a chance to make his records. Four years ago, he told his friend Daryl that had some rhymes, I'm putting you in my group. So he called up, he was like, yo, D, I'm going to make my record. Remember four years ago, I was like, yeah. That's why I tell people, don't be ashamed to show your gift. Like if you're in a room and somebody walks in and you know you could cook, and you hear somebody say, yo, I'm starting a restaurant, I need a cook, put your hand up. Because now you're going to get paid to do the thing that you love. So long story short, we went to the studio, and the idea was just to make one record. Because what kids nowadays don't believe, there was no hip hop on the radio. There was no hip hop touring. There was no hip hop on the video shows. They didn't believe that we would be around. So the, the goal was to go make one record and put it out for the summer. So we went in the studio, made one record just to put it out in the summer and everybody liked it. Oh, cool. So we got a hit, right? So we said, okay, let's make another record. So we made another record and everybody liked it. And then we got the big idea, because nobody was making rap albums at the time. Everything was one record, one single. Put a record out, everybody knows who you are. Put another record out, but nobody had never made an album with 10 rap songs on one album. So in 1984, we said, yo, we're making an album. You know what I'm saying? We got songs, we got beats, we got rhymes, we making an album. 
1984, we made the first self-titled Run DMC album called Run DMC. And it sold a half a million, I mean, yeah, it sold a half a million records. And that's the thing where, now I was just doing it because it was just something to do. But then, the, the single called Rockbox, we put rock and roll, we did hip hop with rock, and that got us on MTV. So now, here I am in show business. But it, it wasn't a goal of mine. So what would you say your favorite song is? My favorite Run DMC song that I made? That you made. Wow, that's a good question. All right, for, for the, for the fa out of the favorites or the known singles, out of the known singles that we dropped as singles, oh man, I love Tricky, but I love Rock and Roll, so it's, it's Walk This Way. It's, which, which wasn't my song, we just did it over. We did an Aerosmith, Stephen Tyler and Joe Perry, we did Aerosmith's Walk This Way over. That's my favorite song to perform, because in my mind, I'm a rock star. <laughs> So <laughs> that's my favorite shirt. song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. ACDC, Le ACDC, Led Zeppelin, The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, The Who. I love uh, Jimi Hendrix. I love old school um, rock and roll. I love classic rock and roll. But out of the songs that wasn't um, singles from Run DMC, we got a song called Together Forever, which is all 808 drum. Boom. Thanks. Because what had happened was when we started getting famous, all the other rappers and people in our neighborhoods and everybody from the hood was like, Run DMC Soft, they commercial. So we was like, what? So we made a record called Together Forever to let them know, don't ever say anything bad about me. Don't say I can do this. And it just starts, party people, your dreams have now been fulfilled. Get out your seat and let's get ill. That's right, y'all. We're not just rough. We're more than tough, and when it comes to rock, I can hold that note forever. We got enough, <laughs> enough, and then we go into like, you know what I'm saying? Because everybody in hip-hop want to claim they hard, and they got lyrics and stuff like that. I don't make records like a Jada Kiss or a Jay-Z or a Young Thug and them, but I can destroy that if I wanted to do that. So we made this record called Together Forever to let people know don't say nothing bad about Run DMC because my music is clean and nice. <laughs> so you're super talented. You said you sold out Madison Square Garden. What was life like as a star? Because that's what you were. Well, I don't think I'm, I, I don't think I'm a star. I mean, I didn't, I didn't see the stardom thing until we did walk this way. And what I mean by that was, we was able to, we was like the most popular thing on earth. And we was able to walk in malls, and when people start all that fan stuff, yo, yo, hold up, calm down, yo, no, no, uh-uh, no, we ain't, no, we're not doing that. We're, we're not, I'm not special, I'm here getting a burger just like you, I'll take the picture, and you sign the order, and we're gonna sit here like we friends. None of that friend, and people would try, one time we tried to tell people no and got chased out of the mall, so. But I, I didn't see that, we didn't want people to see celebrity with Run DMC. We wanted people to see a reflection of themselves, but the fortune and the whole fame thing came when we put out Walk This Way with Aerosmith. It used to be I could drive on the highway, up until 86, I could drive on the highway and look over at a car and go, oh shoot, they go DMC. Or I could stand out on a corner. We used to stand out on a corner in our neighborhoods and our best friends, my best friend was this guy named Douglas Hayes. And we'd just be standing on the corner and he would tell me, yo D, that's the hundredth time that car came around the block. I said, they came around the block a hundred times. Why didn't they stop and pull over? They was like, they scared of you. So the next time the car came around, I caught him up. I was like, you know, they were all shook. But I always took away that fandom paranoia thing and stuff like that. But I remember when Walk This Way came out, now we're all over MTV. That means everybody in America and everybody in the world knows who I am now. Prior to that, you had to have the album to know, oh, yo, that's DMC. So now the whole world knows who I am. The stardom stuff came in, one day I was driving on the Grand Central Parkway in Queens, in my neighborhood, the Grand Central Parkway, right? And I'm driving and I look over like I did for the last, since 84, it's 86 now. And I look over at the car over there, and the people in the car saw me and crashed. So then I know, oh man, I can't just be walking around 
You know what I'm saying? So the stardom thing came with the walk this way thing. Now I know how my, Michael Jackson feel. But prior to that, we, I was able to go anywhere. And, and the crazy thing is we walked around looking like we looked on the albums. But I, I guess it wasn't so different because everybody else, when Red DMC came out, we didn't have costumes. So I dressed just like you. So when you saw me, you wouldn't think I was famous unless you loved my music to that point. So most of the time, I could go to the mall, I could go walk anywhere because I looked like all the other people. But when Walk This Way came out, the hat, the glasses, the gold chain, and Adidas was like a superhero costume. So imagine Spider-Man trying to walk in here and be normal. That's when I started knowing, yo, this is crazy. So I started realizing, yo, I still can dress like that. See how I got the giant jacket on? I'm still me, but I'm not going to wear the black leather and the black. I'm not going to wear the DMC costume everywhere. So it was crazy. Who are your, um, your biggest influences getting into music coming up? My biggest influences getting into the music was the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, Queen, ACDC, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix. Um, the, the, the genre of music they call rock or classic rock. Anything having to do with rock guitars. You know, I was that kid growing up. Like most of my friends, they was into like the Jackson 5. And uh, you know, my mother and father, there, there was Stevie Wonder, Aretha Franklin, Al Green and stuff like that. But for some reason as a kid, I think the reason why I love rock music is I was into comic books. So rock music, they got the loud guitar and they got harder drums than disco and funk. So every time I heard rock music, it was like superheroes to me. It was just something about the, the rock guitar sound is so powerful. So I'm this little shy kid, I gotta get noticed. You know what I'm saying? So my thing was like, okay, what, what, what can I take to my advantage? In order for people to pay attention to me while listening to Eminem and Melly Mel and Jay-Z and Cardi B, how do I fit in? I gotta bring something different to the game. So even in this time now, even I've been around forever, I knew the rock music gave me a, a presentation advantage. Okay, I don't rhyme like Eminem, but my beats and guitars are so loud, when I step on the stage, everybody's gonna pay attention. Now I can get it off. So rock music gave me a strength and a foundation. Like most people now, when, when you think about hip hop, well, when you think about any music, there's something, they both sing, but Prince was different from Michael Jackson, right? The look type of records they made. So when I came along, I was like, okay, everybody rap. So what is the sound that defines defines me? I'm a quiet guy, but my music is loud. So that helps people say, yo, I like that DMC guy. He don't say too much, but when he get on that stage, he brings it on. So it was rock and roll. That's why in 1985, I didn't say, I don't want to be the king of rap. First of all, these rappers are crazy. You know what I'm saying? I don't, don't be shooting at me. Don't be getting mad at me because I'm better than you. So no right. I want to stay away from that nonsense. So I said, I want to be the king of rock. Not because I was just dis disrespecting rap. Let somebody else be the king of rap. I have a bigger enthusiastic vision of myself. So when I started rapping at seven, when I started rapping at 12 years old, I wanted to be on the Mick Jagger, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder level. That's my competition. You, would think you know what I'm saying? You're in rap. Uh -huh. You were thinking bigger than rap. I was thinking bigger than rap, yeah. exactly. So, do you have any role models outside of music? Or did you? Growing up yes, up? no, my main role model outside of music is a man, called, he passed away two years ago, I, I believe, or three years ago. There's a man called Stan Lee. He's the guy that invented Marvel Comics. Stan Lee, who created Spider Man, Captain America, Thor, everything that's going on in the MCU and the movie films. Before the, music, before the movies, I had every book. I had a huge, I had every Spider-Man, every Iron Man, every Submariner, every Avengers, every Ghost Rider. Me and my brother, our attic was full of comic books. All I did was read, collect, and draw comic books. And the reason why he's such an inspiration for me, reading those comic books prepared me to be the person I am today. I'll give my secret away. When hip hop came over the bridge, I was like, okay, how can Daryl make himself known in this universe? Here's my secret. I was just pretending, <laughs> making the making believe, like playtime. I'm the most powerful entity in the hip hop universe. But that happens like like 
when you get on a, because superheroes change, Clark Kent is Superman. Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Dr. Bruce Banner is the Hulk. So Stan Lee taught me, in this world here, like in that world, in the MCU, that universe, define yourself with an adjective that's powerful, positive, and productive, and put your name after it. For instance, if I say the amazing, you'll say Spider-Man. If I say the incredible, you'll say, so that's what Stanley taught me. So when hip hop came over the bridge, mild managed school kid, Daryl McDaniels, when he touches that mic, transforms into the, the initials of my name is DMC, but my adjective is the devastating mic controller. So it's all about transformation. So Stan Lee was a huge inspiration on my musician, on my artistic presentation. I believe that I was a superhero on the mic and it came true. So outside of music, Stan Lee created a monster. That's why if you listen to King of Rock, um, five years ago I started a comic book company because that was another dream that I had. And I was like, just because I'm 50, 50, um, two years old, I don't gotta stop dreaming. So I started a comic book company called DMC, but that stands for Daryl Makes Comics. So when I started my comic book company, I'm allowed to do everything that I was making believe as a kid, I still get to do that now. So everything that you are and everything that you become will always be the thing that will allow you to keep succeeding whether people think it or not. Uh, so what advice would you have for any upcoming artists? Any upcoming artists? Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot, especially in this day and time. Number one, get a good lawyer. Because <laughs> they will, if you good at something, they will take it from you and then they will tell you, they will make you sign a paper that has nothing to do with how good you are. Get a good lawyer, or, or should I say, pay attention to the business. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, when you look at, even in the athletics, you know, it's, it's a business. You know what I'm saying? When you start hearing who owns the team and merchandise, and per it's a business. So, so you don't have to focus on it so much. Have people around you to allow you to focus on your craft or your art or your skill, but have somebody around you because sometimes your brain can't handle all of that because you got to focus on playing the game. But have another person's brain next to you whose job is to make sure they handle your business right. Um, secondly, no matter what it is that you do, you should study the people that came before you. Not only to see what made them good, see where they went wrong so you can avoid doing the things that they do and you can look at where they went wrong and when you're doing your, when you're playing your sport, when you're doing your music, when you're cooking your food, when you're designing your clothes, when you're directing your movies, you want to make sure you're doing things so people after you don't have to make those mistakes. And thirdly, don't be a follower. Whatever it is that you believe in, whatever it is that's on your mind and your heart, especially when people look at you and say, they don't do it like that, or that can't happen, or that's not the way it goes, don't believe that. Because the world is waiting for you to the thing you thought of that nobody did that people think can happen. The, when you think of something, it's done. See, that's what people do. When you think of something, it's done, or else you wouldn't have thought about it. Now it's up to you just to go make it happen. And I always tell little kids, you, when you think about something you want, I want a nice car. It's done. But what you don't realize, it don't come with just thinking it's not magic. You got to work and do something so you can eventually have that car. And thirdly, whatever it is that you do, be responsible. There's people looking at you, especially the younger generation. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people, now this is true too, you don't have to be a role model, you don't have to, um, um, you don't have to care about how people think about you, do what you want to do, you don't have to, but the golden gift of power is you should. 
being responsible makes makes a big big difference in what's really good about you because there's a there's a lot of um like i go to a lot of um events cross-cultural cross-genre like sports events and stuff like that so I, I remember one time i went to the um the nba all-star game right and then you had kareem abdul jabbar there and you had george gervin there and dr j there and michael jordan and all these people now and i remember um I forgot who it was. They was interviewing the, the new guy, the new rookie guy. And he was like, yo, do you go and get advice from, um, you know, the, the veteran players and the legends? He said, nah, 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 you know, I know what I'm doing and all of that stuff like that. And, you know, he has that right to do that. But that's disrespectful to do that because now you're saying what, what the foundation that they built, that you are now part of because you're God-given skill, you're now saying they're not important. You know what I'm saying? And you may have all this, you may be better than Michael Jordan. But understand, before you, there was Michael. Before Michael, there was Dr. J. And it's just good to mention those people so that younger person that idol you, they'll see evolution and they'll see process. I was sp speaking to Jesse Jackson, and everybody was hating on MTV Cribs. The houses are phenomenal. They show you that on MTV. And Jesse Jackson said the only thing wrong with MTV Cribs is they show results and not process. Mm -hmm. So a kid watching MTV is like, whoa, I could get that house in the night. That kid would say, man, I got to have that house like, you know, Rick Ross. So instead of doing legitimate things, going through a process that will get them the house four years from now or maybe 10 years from now, They'll go sell drugs to get it, or they'll go do stick-ups to get it. But those things don't last. So it's very important that when you're dominant at whatever career or trade or craft or skill you're at, you have to show the beginning, the present, so that the people looking at you realize where they can take it. It's like when I was speaking at school four, I like going to high schools, middle schools, and, and schools, speaking to the kids now of this generation, because they'll explain to me, you know, why baby's good. They'll explain to me why young thug is good. They'll explain to me why Cardi B is good. And I'm like, wow, cool, cool. So I'll look at the new things that they're doing, and I'll apply my old school way of creating to this new thing. So that when I walk in, even though I'm the old school, a young person can sit there and watch DMC do a show and won't seem like it's old or over. So we are never older. We are continually, constantly evolving and growing collectively. And the power of hip hop is the OGs like me sitting here having dialogue with the young Gs. When we do that, we become unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Adding on to that, how would you say it feels to be a hip hop legend? Oh, I don't think I'm a hip hop legend because the real pioneers, and I just started doing this about 10 years ago. The real pioneers of hip hop are the young boys and girls who created hip hop before any rap records or any videos, any radio play, any tours was done. So before, let's say rappers delight, the real pioneers are those boys and girls from the Bronx, Manhattan, Harlem, Brooklyn, and Queens, but let's just say the Bronx, because that's where it started and it spread. The real pioneers is every DJ, MC, or rapper, if you want to identify with that, break dancer, graffiti artist, and beatboxer before we got in the show business. Because those boys and girls created this whole culture of music, style, language, art, and dance. So they are the real pioneers. Everybody, if you come into a recording business, there's possibility for success because now you got promotion and marketing and you got dollars behind you and you got radio play and you got exposure on you know, radio and TV. Think about the people, the young boys and girls who created hip hop. They had none of that and this thing spread around the world. So I like to say I am a representative of the hip hop culture and I think the reason that the most valuable thing about me is look I've been doing it forever and I'm still around to talk about it so um, it's an honor and privilege for Run DMC 
to become the faces of all hip hop from every generation. But the real pioneers, let me say some names. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Grand Wizard Theodore and the Fantastic Five. Uh, cool Mo D, Easy Lee and the Treacherous Three MCs uh, featuring Cool Mo D, who in the 90s battled LL Cool J. The Funky Four Plus One. Lovebug Starsky, Busy B Starsky, DJ Hollywood, uh, DST, uh, who else am I missing? The Fearless Four. Everybody before Rapper's Delight. So if, if y'all want to know what hip hop was like before we made these records, go check out the real pioneers, the Rock Steady crew. There's a, a, a 13 year old girl, a 13 year old Puerto Rican girl named Lady Pink who at 13 years old was running around New York City tagging the trains with all the dudes. Those are the pioneers because they created this whole culture. I think it's crazy how that culture started as a small thing in the Bronx, probably like in a small little neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And now it's the biggest thing in the whole country, the whole, kind of like the whole world basically. It's, it's crazy. The one thing. Yeah, when, when you have something that is, is relevant to a community, a nation, a group of people, or something like that. It's always those organic, grassroots, raw, um, gritty things that, you know, it started in the Bronx, then it spread to Manhattan, then it spread to Brooklyn, then it spread to Queen, then it spread to Staten Island, then it spread to DC and Connecticut. It started like the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Right, and then it spread across America. That's how I relate it to you. Yeah, we we created so uh, we created a uh, we created a, a epidemic worse than the zombie apocalypse <laughs> with this hip hop thing. I think better, but um, so you said you were a straight A student. You mm -hmm. got any tips for students who want to be like you in the class? Yes, yes. Now, now, now. First of all, is the victory is trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying, and trying even if you keep failing, 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 failing. That's why you keep failing. You're, you're, you're developing a routine. You learn by repetition. And you, you, um, nothing is finalized. Until, that's why you practice, right? You, track, you practice. You don't just wake up tomorrow and go run a race. You practice to get to those levels. You know what I'm saying? So the first thing that I want to say as a straight A student, all you have to do is just keep reading and studying. Don't, don't let the school grading system curriculum um, define you as a person. Those are just tasks. You know what I'm saying? I, I was a straight A student, but I hated math. I got an F in trigonometry. An F, and it was crazy. And I heard I got an F, like it was the worst thing in the world. I was so used to getting A's and B's and stuff like that. And I was losing, I was panicking, and then my, um, I remember um, my teacher brother signing because I went to um, All Boys Catholic High School, um, Brother Simon pulled me in the hallway and said, Daryl, if you apply yourself, you can do it. So it took me the whole year, but I worked my way back up to a B. I got an F, then I got a D, then I got a C, then I got the B. It was hard to get the A though, but because I didn't get A doesn't mean that I failed. And, it, and another thing is, uh, a, a, a grade doesn't, a, a grade is not absolute. You know what I'm saying? There, there, there are geniuses on paper. You know what I'm saying? There are geniuses on paper, but then you'll hear somebody, what's more important, and I learned this in life, for that kid that can't get above the C, what's more important to your position in your career, in your place in life, somebody might value your C continuous effort over to the person that gets the A easily. Okay, you're smart, you, you, you can read something and you could get the A, but this kid right here is ruthless. He's relentless, he comes with the eye of the tiger every single time. That's who I want working for me. You know what I'm saying? So don't, don't, don't be defined by a grading system because your reward is in the effort that you put in it. I tell kids, the only person that can call you a failure or allow you to fail is the person that you see in the mirror. It ain't the teacher's fault, it ain't the school curriculum's fault. The only way that you fail is if you let that person in the mirror down. Uh, personal question for mm -hmm. me, and I'm sure other people on the know, do you still tour and perform? Yes, I'm so tired right now. They keep adding that. Imagine touring 
right off the music thing, and then you put out a comic book, and now, in addition to touring, um, I gotta go do Comic Cons. So I, I didn't notice, every state, every country, and London has a Comic Con, mm -hmm. Seattle has a Comic Con, New York has a Comic Con, Vegas, everybody has a Comic Con. So the only time I'm not home, or I ask to be home, not on a road touring, is Christmas. I gotta be home the week of Christmas to New Year's, but um, I work New Year's, I work um, Thanksgiving, I work my birthday. It's a constant grind, and that's a very important question because people think just because I'm not on the radio and just because I'm not on MTV anymore that I still don't do this. Um, I probably do maybe, well at this stage I probably do at one time, if it's 365 days in a year, at one time we was on the road almost 300 days a year. So now, since you know Jam Master J passed away, rest in peace to Jam Master J, um, I probably do 150 shows a year. In addition to the Comic Cons, but now it's worse. In addition to the Comic Cons and the concerts I do, I gotta go to school <laughs> to talk about the Daryl's Dream Book. So I'm tired, but the, the enjoyment is being able to create and do something, I'm 57 years old, but I feel like I'm 12 because it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. So it's, it's a lot of work though, but being 50, I'm tired. I want to sleep. You know this as being an athlete. Sometimes the knees and back hurt. It gets worse when you get over 40. But since I enjoy what I'm doing, I can handle it. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Back question. What would you say your reaction was when you found out the group went platinum? Because I knew I was big during that time. It was multi platinum. Right? Multi platinum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, know, you know what their action is? I made it! Yes! I'm Michael Jackson now! You know what I'm saying? I'm Whitney Houston now! Like it was crazy. It put us up. I'm Cher! I'm Bono from U2! I'm Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones! It's like, it's, it's, a, it's crazy. To, to sell the record and then have, because you know, it's funny. You sit there, you know, even as y'all, you're sitting there and you're watching everybody else do something. And then the day that you do it, it's like, but then the other thing is, and it ain't all cut out. To, it ain't all as cut out as it, people make it to be. Because for us, it was a little different because we wasn't doing it to sell the records. We wasn't doing it to get in war. We was doing it because we like doing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, even now, it's funny with me, I get invited to everything. But most of the time, they want me to come and, and just be, hey, DMC's in the crowd, he, he used to. Hard, wait, no, if I'm coming, I gotta perform. You know what I'm saying? And I remember I was speaking at a high school one time, and one kid, he was trying to diss, right? He was like, yo, Run DMC, you know, the old school stuff is cool, but you guys are over. And I was like, yeah, thank you for telling me that. And he was like, huh? I said, yeah, man, I'm proud to be over. And to answer your question about touring, I said, yeah, I was just over in Singapore last week, asked my manager, we getting ready to go over London tomorrow. And the whole gym was like sparking out, you know what I'm saying? Because I still go over, I travel over the places. So I'm just at a point where I think, what's you, uh, I think um, to really answer your question is when you achieve that moment, it's like, yeah, but then you realize it's not about that goal. Mm -hmm. It's about having an opportunity to keep, okay, I, we sold 500 million records, we sold a million records, we sold two or three, we went multi-platinum. It's a point where, when Michael Jackson sold 41 Thriller albums. 41 Thriller albums. You might not never do that again, and of course, your next album might not sell, you might sell five million the next time. So it's not about the numbers, it's about the opportunity realizing, all right, I did that and I made this, I made this accomplishment. But the real accomplishment is being able to do the thing that got you that accomplishment every day that you wake up. So that's the thing that keeps me excited and grounded. That's the thing that makes me go, all right, I'll go do the concert. Or, cause Look, making the records is easy. Promotion, marketing, shooting a video, doing the interviews, yo, you gotta go to sleep at 12 o'clock, you gotta fight 5 a.m. in the morning. 
People don't see that part of it. They don't see that out like you as an athlete. They see you win the race or come in first, second, or third or whatever, but they don't see the effort and the training that goes into it. So for me, my joy is knowing what in the world did I do to get to this point? I gotta wake up every day and do that every day, even if nobody ever buy my record again. I think that's the thing that keeps us focused. Closing. Yeah. I'll do the last question. Yeah. Wrap it up. Uh, it says, "What new artists inspire you today?" That's a personal question. Oh. Well. Okay. What new artists? Who catches your eye now? Um. All right. Uh, a young man named Chance the Rapper. Uh, Kendrick Lamar. Um. Um. Who else did I like? Um. Chance the Rapper. Kendrick Lamar, uh, who else? Is that? Somebody else knew. Um, 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 some little Uzi Vert songs, because my son, my son's what, 25 years old, he puts me up on a lot of stuff. Some little, little, little I can't even say these guys' names. <laughs> little, little Uzi Vert, right? That's how you say it. Um, Chance the Rapper, Kendrick Lamar, um, little, little Uzi, let me just, and, um, Dang, there was this other um, there was this other artist that I heard the other day, um, um, but he ain't put out a record in so long. And I'm trying to figure Bryson Tiller. Bryson Tiller. Yeah, I like Bryson Tiller because he say, he makes se same song he records and he can rap. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's like fly. I like that. But yeah, Bryson Tiller. <laughs> I'm talking to Bryson. Bryson, put out one more record so I can enjoy you, man. Come on. <laughs> I feel the same way. Yeah, right? Yeah. He's good. Yeah. Well, any final comments you want to say before we sign off? No, it's just an honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to have dialogue and have a, a presence in young people's lives, even though I'm the OG. And, um, you know, like my song that I made in 85, um, The King of Rock. I say I'm the king of rock, there is none higher. Sucker MC should call me sire to burn my kingdom. You must use fire, but I won't stop rocking till I retire. What that rhyme means is they could take away all of this. But as long as you have you, there's no stopping you. Nobody defines how long you do something, when you do something, or how you do something. It's up to you. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to still... Um, Live my life the same way I lived it when I was 12 years old in my room, just pretending to be something. Well, thanks for being here. It was a pleasure to talk to you. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me.